Welcome everybody to the seminar today. Our speaker is Hanna Dalpoz Krimska, and she'll be telling us about curvature variation based adaptive sampling for Delaunay triangulations of Riemannian manifolds. All right, thank you, Henry. So hello everybody. Um, so the work I wanna talk to you about uh, today is a joint work with my colleague from IST Austria, Matthias Windragen. And what we are tackling, um, oops, all right. All right, so what we're tackling is um, how to uh, triangulate Riemannian manifolds. In particular, um, you are or we are given a manifold, Riemannian manifold, which is called M, and a point sample. And the question is, can you find a triangulation um, of the manifold M such that the vertex set um, of the triangulation is the point sample P? And when I say can you, I mean, can you give me a specific procedure um, that yields this triangulation? And indeed, such a procedure already exists, and it consists of three steps. Um, in the first step, um, you are given the point sample, and you need to decide. Um, so you need to impose like some combinatorial structure on the point called P. And this means that you need to decide which of the points of the point sample you want to connect to form syntheses. Once you have this abstract combinatorial structure, um, you uh, want to make sure that each of the abstract simplices can actually be drawn onto the manifold. We call this realized. Um, and in the last step uh, of this procedure, uh, you want to take all these Riemannian simplices that you constructed in the second step, and you want to patch them together to form a triangulation of the manifold. Unfortunately, this procedure does not always work. And in fact, it can fail in every one of these three steps uh, that I just described, if the point sample that you choose is arbitrary. So what we did is we provided, uh, or we provide quality criteria on the point sample P that guarantee that this procedure succeeds. We are by far not the first ones to do this. Um, however, um, our approach is particular because it's very geometric, it's based on a lot of geometric observations, say. And also these criteria or our criteria are easily satisfied if the remaining manifold M has locally almost constant sectional curvature, which is also non-zero. We do not consider the case um, where the manifold is almost planar or almost, yeah, <laughs> almost planar, say, or almost flat. Um, but we, we want to consider um, the situations where the manifold is locally either almost a sphere or at almost hyperbolic space. All right, um, the outline. Um, so my talk will consist of three parts. In the first part, I wanna look a little bit in detail in, on this procedure that I already described. And in particular, tell you where does the procedure fail. Um, in the second part of my talk, uh, I will tell you a little bit about how to measure the, the quality of a point sample P. So what parameters are there used by the community to assess um, quality of a point sample? Uh, and the third and the longest and most exciting part of the talk will be uh, telling you about our methods and our results. All right, so the procedure. As I said, the procedure consists of three steps. And the first step is to determine the combinatorial structure um, of the point cloud. And for this, we use the well-established uh, Voronoi Delone cell decomposition. So we have a look at the Voronoi diagram um, of the manifold. Um, then we take its nerve. Um, this um, resulting object is a simplicial complex, and we call it the Delaunay simplicial complex of P. Um, you think, well, you know, this is nothing new. Everybody does this. Um, and then um, most of you will be familiar with this phrase, uh, which says that if the points of P are in general position, meaning there are no K plus two points on a K sphere, um, then the dimension of the Delaunay simplex sorry, the only simplicial complex fits the dimension of the manifold and we are okay. Um, however, this is exactly the point where this procedure, the first step of the procedure might fail. 
why does it fail? Um, well, it does not fail um, if the manifold is uh, the Euclidean space. It also does not fail if more generally the manifold is space of constant sectional curvature, meaning either the Euclidean space or a sphere or a hyperbolic space. And it also holds or also works out if the dimension of the manifold is low enough. So if the manifold is either a Riemannian curve or a Riemannian um, surface, then you're also fine. Um, when the dimension of the manifold is higher, uh, you might run into problems with, with certain spheres and, and, and certain centers. And there is a concrete counterexample by Borsona, Dyer, and Gosch from uh, 1213 um, that describes precisely the failure of this procedure. All right, so suppose we you know, miraculously succeeded in the first step. The next step is, um, say I take a, a simplex of the Delaunay simplicial complex and I want to realize it, so I want to draw it on the manifold. Um, if the simplex is 1D, so if it's an edge, uh, this is actually very easy, it's always possible. You just take the two endpoints and you connect them with geodesic. And because we are in a remaining manifold and say the points are close enough, whatever, this will work. What do we do for higher dimensional syntheses? Well, what we are kind of generally used to from Euclidean space and so on is the notion of convex hull. So the convex hull is the smallest convex set of the points and you know, it works out. Um, except that for general manifolds, it does not. Uh, and that's because the convex hull is in general not defined. So it is always defined in the Euclidean spaces. It is always defined in uh, spheres or hyperbolic um, spaces. And it is also always defined if the dimension of the manifold is low. So if we are, if the manifold is a curve or a surface. Um, however, if the dimension of the manifold is larger than two, uh, we have the following question or open question by Virgie. Uh, it says if I take three points um, in a manifold of high, high enough dimension, what is the smallest convex set in this manifold that contains the three points? And this is an open question. It's, it's not clear. And here um, you mean uh, like geodesically convex? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, right. Um, so convex hull is a problem. However, uh, we do not despair uh, because we have an alternative um, construction, which is called the Riemannian center of mass construction, which was defined by Carter in 1973. Um, the Riemannian center of mass construction uh, has certain conditions to be fulfilled. So that's one thing that we need to be careful about. And the second thing we have to be careful about is that this construction might yield degenerate simplicities. And we do not want degenerate simplicities. So that's another thing to watch out for. All right, the third thing, the third uh, step, hatching it up. Um, this is actually the step I will be talking about the least. Um, there is a lemma, it's called Whitney's lemma. And this, uh, basically, this lemma tells us that if we, um, if we fulfill the conditions of the lemma, then we can patch the triangles up and it all works, it all works out. But I will not uh, talk about the lemma itself uh, or about the conditions. So you'll have to either trust me on that or you know, have a look in the paper later. All right. So uh, the second part of the talk. Um, what is a good point sample? Um, maybe first of all, let's think about like intuitively what, what, what should a good point sample be? Um, well, first of all, we somehow want the points to cover the manifold like well enough so that we can drag enough information out of it. However, um, we probably don't want too many points. And in particular, if you think about you know, applications in computer science or in, in other parts of science uh, where you want to do algorithms, the number of points is directly proportional to the complexity um, of, the, uh, of the algorithm. So we want sort of as little points as possible but at the same time enough. So that's the intuition. Um, so what are the um, conditions sort of used uh, 
to assess the quality. Um, well, first thing to note, uh, and this actually holds for the whole part of the talk, is that the conditions will be local. We will actually never be considering the whole manifold, but we will always sort of take a patch, like a small neighborhood U, and we will define everything on this neighborhood. Um, and then sort of, in theory, what you would want to do later is divide your manifold into these patches and you know apply the theory to all these patches and then somehow put it together. So locality is very important. All right, so we said we somehow want that the points cover the manifold or the neighborhood well enough. And this uh, we call density, and it is quantified as follows. So um, you take the points of the point cloud in the neighborhood and you draw balls of radius epsilon around each point cloud. And the requirement is that these balls cover the whole neighborhood. Um, right. The second thing was somehow we don't want too many points or in other words, but it's not exactly in other words, but it's similar. We do not want to be points to be too close together. And uh, this is quantified by the sparsity parameter mu. So you do the same thing. You take the neighborhood, you take the points in the neighborhood, and then you draw a ball of radius mu around each um, of the points of the point cloud in the neighborhood. And the condition here is that these balls should be disjoint. They should not intersect. So the density and the sparsity parameters, uh, sometimes also called the E epsilon nu, <laughs> uh, epsilon nu net, um, are the most commonly used parameters sort of for any kind of uh, quality assessment of the point, point called P. However, um, this is not enough if you are talking about the general remaining manifold. There is another condition which kind of plays the role of this general position that I talked about earlier. And it's called the delta protection. Um, so you might recall that um, the Delaunay triangulations have this special property. If you take a simplex and you draw a ball uh, or the certain ball of the simplex, then you know that on the interior and uh, on, the, on the boundary of this ball, you will find no uh, other point uh, of the point sample safe for the points that already um, form the simplex. So the delta protection is kind of a fortified version of this notion. So you say, I, I do not only want this property of the ball, but I actually want to be able to grow the ball a little bit by, by a parameter delta. And in this, in this thickened ball with this uh, delta parameter, I also want to make sure that no other vertices than no other points than the vertices of the simplex are contained. All right, so these are the three parameters to work with. Um, and what we do is we bound these three parameters in terms of the difference between the maximum and the minimum sectional curvature of, of new or, or of the neighborhood. Um, this in particular means, so it's it's really the difference between the two curvatures. So if my um, manifold new or if my neighborhood U has an almost constant sectional curvature, means that this difference is very low. And this means that the um, conditions uh, on epsilon nu and delta will be very, um, very weak, say very easy to satisfy. And that's what we want. All right. So now, uh, the most exciting part of the talk is uh, what we did. All right. Um, so I will first sort of tell you about different pieces of the puzzle, and then I'll put them together. Um, so the first piece of the puzzle is um, the analysis of the Voronoi diagram, or sort of thinking about some, some uh, properties of the Voronoi diagram. Um, so uh, remember, um, that that these the sort of the Voronoi cells, first of all, are the sets of all points that are closer to one point of the point sample than to others. This means in particular that the intersection of these cells, meaning the lower dimensional faces um, of, uh, of the Voronoi diagram, must lie on um, intersections or on, say, on bisectors of the pair of points. In, uh, in the diagram. What do I mean by that? Have a look at the picture and say we take two points uh, of, from the point cloud. I'll call them P1 and P2. Um, and then the bisector uh, of these two points 
So this is, is the set of all points um, in the, uh, on the manifold that are equidistant from these two points. And you see that, for example, in this particular uh, in this particular picture, there is one edge of the triangulation that will lie precisely um, on the or the on the bisector between P1 and P2. Um, and what we can do further with this equation, uh, which is might seem not very <laughs> sort of uh, giving more information than before, is we can we can rewrite it um, sort of by putting one side uh, of the equation to the other and putting an absolute value, which actually does not add any information. Okay, so in the first piece of the puzzle, we have um, represented the faces um, of, of the Voronoi diagram with these equations. Right, uh, second piece of the puzzle. So this one is a bit of a out of the blue. <laughs> uh, so what we do is we assume that there exists a map from uh, from the manifold or from the uh, from the patch u into a space of constant curvature. So here uh, I will represent uh, the curvature by k, um, and I will actually only show you pictures of the sphere. Um, but the same theory will hold if I would have a hyperbolic space instead. So I have this map psi, and this map psi will be a near isometry. What does this mean? Um, say I take two points in my neighborhood U, which I call X and Y, and I measure the distance between those two points. Then I look at the image of those two points, which are in red on the right, and I measure the distance between those. Then I require that the distance, the difference between the distances between the green and the red curve is very, very small. And this parameter or this upper bound on, on all the distances will be called mu. And we will call it um, the distortion parameter of the map psi. Right. So as I said, out of the blue, we assume that this map exists. Um, and now we want to put these two things together. So on the one hand, I have this green equation for the bisectors. And on the other hand, I have this dark green, red, black equation for uh, the distortion of the map. And if I combine them, I actually actually find out that the bisector, which is in light green on the left, will be mapped in this yellow region on the right, which has this following super, super ugly formula. Um, so the Basically, the, the starting task of the project was, uh, you know, what is this set? <laughs> um, all right. Um, ah, um, to show you what this set is, I will actually uh, just consider the unit sphere. Um, but you can um, get the result on any sphere of any curvature from the unit sphere by scaling. And I will also touch a little bit upon the, the hyperbolic hyperbolic space. All right. So what is this set? Um, I will sort of, for the sake of notation, I will not use uh, the the psi and uh, and the, the notation hk. Um, so I will I will just I'll explain you the situation kind of from the scratch. Say I take two points on the sphere, which I call P and Q, and I want to know what's the set of all points on the sphere, X, such that the difference of the distances uh, from X to P and from X to Q is less than some um, parameter, which, which is too new in this case, but it's just some constant. So what is this set? Uh, I will call this set the dilated bisector um, of P and Q with respect to mu. And um, why is it called a dilated bisector? Well, I mean, it is very easy to see from the property uh, that the larger you grew, you grow the, uh, the parameter mu, the larger the set becomes. So you have some kind of an inclusion of the sets. And in addition, if you set mu to be zero, you, pre you get precisely the bisector of uh, of the points P and Q. So you can see this sort of as a dilation of the, of the bisector by the parameter mu. Um, all right. 
Yeah, and um, maybe let me recall here that we really we do not look at S2 as on the picture, but we look at any any dimensional sphere. And in this any dimensional sphere, you want to know you want to know exactly what this set is. Um, all right. Uh, what well, it turns out that um, this n dimension or n plus one even dimensional problem can be reduced to a planar problem, which is like it's actually really um, it's simplified simplified the whole project by a lot. Um, so let's recall that the distance uh, in the space of in the on the sphere is defined by the scalar product um, of the two points. Um, this means in particular that you can represent the point x, any point x on the sphere, as a uh, sum of two vectors. If you now think of uh, Sn as lying in R n plus 1 in the vector space, um, and one of the vectors will be lying in the plane, which is spanned by the points p and q, and the other will be perpendicular to it. This is quite simple. You can use um, what is it, Gram Schmidt for it, but there is always a unique representation of this. Um, now, if you plug this red formula for x um, into, into the definition of the distance, um, you will get that the upper formula, so the difference between the distances, actually only affects the part of x that lies in the plane. Like the, the, the part x perp, the part that's perpendicular to the plane is completely irrelevant. Um, so this is a planar problem, and that um, actually um, kind of makes our situation easier. Now I will I'll do a little step. Um, so now we are basically asking, we are in the plane, and we want to know um, what is the solution of this formula. And here we just kind of did some you know trial and error, and we found out that this is actually an ellipse. Um, OK. So the solution for the points in the plane is an ellipse. That's the solution. Ah, sorry, here there should be r n plus one actually. The solution for um, all points in the r n plus one dimensional space is the solution of the plane times the complementary space. Uh, I call this an elliptic cylinder because in R three you can imagine that you take the ellipse and you sort of you know scale it up and down. But the same identical construction works for higher dimensional spaces uh, as well. And then coming back to the problem, what is this dilated by uh, di dilated by sector B nu? Well, you just take the solution in R n plus one and you intersect it with the sphere. Um, I, at this point, I would like to mention that we have an explicit formula for this ellipse. So not only we know that it is an ellipse, but we actually have the precise um, parametric equation for it, um, which is great uh, because we know the um, the formula for the for the uh, dilated bisector, you know, precisely, explicitly. We can calculate with it, um, and that's a very powerful um, powerful tool. Anka, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. So this elliptical cylinder, it's not really centered at the origin of the sphere, is it? Is it centered more towards like the midpoint between P and Q or? Uh, it's actually it's actually centered at the origin. So huh. um, yeah, like it was difficult to draw, draw this, I must say. But if you look at uh, at this point, so here you're really looking from above, sort of. I see. And, but it's, and the ellipse is really like this. But it's skewed, it's skewed such that it sort of points towards yeah. P and Q. Gotcha, gotcha, that yeah, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wish I could uh, I could draw draw it better, but the idea is that you take this ellipse and then you wanna you know put the paper almost horizontally and then you you look at the ellipse. <laughs> I was not exactly sure how to draw it. Um, yeah, but it's actually not so difficult to see um, because there are lots of um, there are lots of uh, symmetries. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Um, yes. So um, as I said, we have an explicit formula for this for this elliptic cylinder and for the dilated bisector in the case where um, the space of constant curvature is a sphere. And um, we actually have, we can use the, the exact same strategy with this reduce, reduction to the, to the plane to deduce the same result 
uh, for the hyperbolic space. And the only difference is that these, these sets um, that were ellipses in this case will be kind of hyperbolas, but not hyperbolas x squared minus y squared is equal to one, but you know there will be a little bit of a distortion. But um, the, the absolutely fascinating thing about, about these two cases is that, that the calculations are the same. <laughs> they, are, they are really, you just have to add like an h when you when you when you do the hyperbolic case, you have you don't have arc cos, but you have arc cos. You just have to add an h everywhere, and and it just goes through. Um, yes, which is like absolutely fascinating. Um, and maybe I should add that um, I also considered the same question for the Euclidean case, although it's not really relevant to our project. And there, the calculations were different. <laughs> I also got the result, but uh, you could not do this reduction that, that, that we did here. So there you go. OK, um, so, so now uh, we know what are the dilated bisectors, and we can calculate them precisely. We can calculate them precisely. That means we can also calculate their intersections precisely. Like we, can, we are in total control of these, of these dilated sets. And we use this um, we use this to control the Voronoi diagram or the, the Voronoi faces of the original the Voronoi diagram. How do we do that? Well, um, maybe before I go to this step, um, what we do is um, we look at the image of the point cloud P in the neighborhood, which will be Psi P. And then uh, we can consider the Voronoi uh, diagram of these points on the sphere. Um, then we know that for each, uh, this should not be cell, this should be face. So for each face um, of the Voronoi diagram on the manifold, um, the image um, of, this, um, of this face will lie in the dilated bisector of the corresponding um, of the corresponding uh, uh, face in the in the Voronoi diagram of the image, and we know precisely what this is because that's like some intersection of the dilated bisectors that we calculated before. This means, in particular, yes, this is known explicitly, and um, yes, the something I wanted to add that. Uh, as you remember, the dilated bisectors get closer and closer to the original bisectors as nu goes to zero. That means also if nu goes to zero or it's, if it's almost zero, then this orange set will almost correspond to the um, to the face in the um, in the Voronoi diagram of the image. And since um, yes, uh, and since the green, uh, the image of the green cell will be inside this orange space. It will be almost identical to the to the red section. This means, in particular, um, that if the distortion parameter nu is small enough, the the red and the green uh, Voronoi diagrams will have the same combinatorics. And because they have the same combinatorics, the Nerves, meaning the Delaunay uh, cell decompositions, will also have the cell uh, the same uh, combinatorics, and we know that um, under some mild assumption on, on uh, the image of the point in P, uh, the combinatorics of the red Vor Voronoi diagram is correct. So the Vor the combina combinatorics of the green diagram will also be correct, and we have that we are done with our first point. Okay, but this is not the end. Uh, basically, we are already like we've done all the hard part. Now we are just deducing everything that we need. Um, as I mentioned, if if the uh, distortion is very small, the uh, the image, so the green path uh, on the on the right and the red uh, uh, red edge, they will be very very close to each other. Um, so in particular, the dis distance between them, the Hausdorff distance, is bounded. Sort of by the let's say by the by the size um, of the dilated bisector, um, and this means that um, not only we have the same combinatorics, 
but we also know that the Voronoi diagrams are geometrically very close. So, so they look almost the same. Um, and this again means that the dual Delaunay uh, triangulations are almost the same. Uh, maybe I should add that I am comparing the Delaunay uh, triangulation of the image of the point cloud and the image of the Delaunay triangulation um, of the point cloud on the sphere. So I have two different triangulations on the sphere and I'm comparing those two on the right. Yes, and so they will be geometrically close. And that means in particular um, that the Riemannian simplices uh, that we get um, that we get via the um, Kasha construction uh, via the Riemannian center of mass construction will be non-degenerate. Or better said, I can control the non-degeneracy of the Riemannian simplices by the non-degeneracy of the simplices in the image, so of the red, because I know that the Red simplices under certain conditions are big enough, and thus, and so are the the images of the green simplices, and thus, because the um, distortion is small enough, are the original simplices. And with that, we are through our um, second point. Anke, can I ask you another question? Yes, of course. So this was sort of the, uh, like the realization step, right before you glue things together. Yes. So you have you have a, a simplex where you know where its vertices are, and then the um, the, the Karcher center of mass that you're using is you have very central coordinates in that simplex, but then you think of that as a probability measure and you just map each point in that combinatorial simplex down using the Karcher mass to the to the manifold, the Karcher center of mass to the manifold. Is that right? Yes, yes, okay. that's exactly the construction. I, I didn't want to go into details of that, but yes, thank you. Um, yeah. All right. Um, the last step of the construction was this was this Whitney lemma that I didn't want to go uh, into detail too much. Um, basically, I will really uh, swipe almost all the information under the carpet here and tell you that because we have this geometrical uh, proximity of the two triangulations, the map psi satisfies the conditions of the Whitney lemma, and thus the whole process goes goes through. All right, so that was a bit that was a bit fast. <laughs> okay, so um, here is sort of a, a premature uh, summary of uh, my talk. What is it that we did? Um, well, the goal was um, given a point sample to construct a triangulation of the manifold, and um, we have seen that there is a pop pipeline which is unfortunately faulty. And we have to deal with um, problems with the dimension of the complex, uh, of the simplicial complex uh, created by the Voronoi Delaunay cell decomposition. In the second step, we have to deal with degeneracy of the simplices. And in the um, third step, which I didn't talk about too much, is the we, we have some, we might have some orientation problems, meaning that the, the gluing might not um, might not work out. And um, we have done some observations, starting with this um, Voronoi spaces being uh, related to bisectors. Um, and the assumption uh, on this map Psi uh, with a very small distortion factor. We have analyzed, um, or we have defined and analyzed thickened bisectors. We have obtained an explicit formula. And um, these observations helped us fix the pipeline. So we are happy. Now you can tell me, um, hang on, hang on, hang on. This is like, I mean, it, it, it's, it's nice, right? But there are lots of questions kind of left open. So like, first of all, how can you guarantee that this, that this uh, parameter new is small enough? Or, or what does it even mean that it's small enough? Um, and what does what is this psi even? I mean, you said that it exists, but but you know, how can you? Does it really exist? Does it always exist? Um, then I also assume that this psi uh, maps into a space of constant curvature, but I didn't tell you what is the curvature. So so what is the value of this curvature that I that I consider? And then if you go to the very beginning of the talk. I kind of promised you something about these parameters, epsilon, mu, and delta. And the 
so far I didn't mention anything about these parameters in the talk. So what about that? All right. Um, so I will. So here is basically when where, where the geometry stops and where we start um, doing a lot of approximation. So it gets a bit gets a bit ugly, and I will not uh, bother you with the precise um, with the precise formulas. But I will sort of tell you how can we get from this picture to the answers to the problem. Um, so first of all, I will uh, I will address the green problem. What is the curvature? Mm, well, this is all. All of this is defined um, by uh, taking the neighborhood view, and in this neighborhood, you want to have a look at the maximum and the minimum sectional curvature. I will denote them lambda u and lambda l, so lambda upper and lambda l, lower and upper bound for the curvature. And um, the first thing that you do is that uh, you define k as some kind of an average, uh, weighted average of these two numbers. Um, if the curvature is positive, so uh, first of all, you always assume that lambda u and lambda l have the same sign. So you, you do not kind of want to pass through Euclidean space. Um, if both of them are positive, so you know that your manifold is sort of spherical, then it's actually the average. If it's negative, um, so if your manifold is sort of a hyperbolic space, there is already there, there is like a complicated formula. Um, for, for this um, for this um, curvature k. Um, so once we have once we know what space we want to map into, um, this map psi will be defined as the concatenation of exponential maps. Um, if you don't know what's an exponential map from a manifold onto a uh, onto its tangent plane or 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 backwards. Do not worry. There, there are these maps where you basically you stand on your manifold at a point, and then you have this tangent space, and you kind of walk on the manifold in the direction, and that gives you some kind of a map into the tangent space. And for small enough neighborhood, this map is a is a homeomorphism. So you can use this map to map from M to the tangent space of M, which is some kind of a Euclidean space. And you can use this map from the, the inverse sort of, of, of a map from a plane onto a space of constant curvature. And this concatenation gives you the map psi. All right. Um, and then actually this, this map psi will be given explicitly um, once you choose your neighborhood U. Um, and once you have the map, you can calculate the distortion and the uh, already there, it's a big formula, but it's given in terms of the difference between the curvatures times the diameter of the um, of the neighborhood U. So these are basically your um, points. If, if you're, let's say, an applied scientist, this is where you can play. If if you choose a, um, a neighborhood U, which is too large, um, as in like this, if the curvature uh, on your neighborhood U is very, very small, you can choose U to be large and vice versa. If you are kind of looking at the neighborhood of your manifold where it's very bumpy and the curvature changes a lot, you want to choose the, um, the neighborhoods very, very small so that you keep this parameter new as small as possible or as small as necessary. So. All right, um, last question. <laughs> is a little bit more complicated. Unfortunately, it would not fit, fit into the previous slide. And um, this basically kind of goes from M to the space of curvature and back again. Um, so assume um, that um, your P is a delta protected epsilon unit for some parameters, delta epsilon and mu. Um, and you consider the image of uh, of p under this map psi. Then you know, because you can control the distortion of the image, you know that the image uh, of p will also be some kind of an epsilon nu net, which is delta protected, except that these epsilon, delta, and nu will be a bit different. And, the, and they will, this, this difference will depend on the original epsilon, uh, nu, and delta, and also on the distortion nu. Um, we know that the pipeline succeeds if um, if each triangle, each each green simplex is 
I was talking about non-degenerate, but what you actually want is like good quality. You really don't want them to be too flat. Um, there is a very huge formula uh, which quantifies what is good quality. Um, but what is important to know for us is that um, I don't really know if the green um, simplex is of good quality, but I know that is of good quality if the corresponding simplex in the space of constant curvature is of an even better quality, whatever that means. But you can kind of uh, define the difference in the quality, say, uh, or control the difference in the quality via the distortion factor nu, as before. The good thing is that um, I can measure the quality of the red simplex, and I can express it in terms of the delta and epsilon and um, nu of the space of constant curvature. And those are in turn defined uh, by the original epsilon and delta and nu. So this is basically how you can guarantee by going to the space of constant curvature and back that um, each of your simplices is of good enough quality. Unfortunately, uh, you know, by skipping from one place, one space to another, um, the actual bounds of the ex actual expressions become kind of kind of hairy. <laughs> and um, there is also another additional part that that uh, uh, I keep skipping, which is like when does the when does the Whitney lemma hold? And that creates additional conditions of these on, on these parameters delta and epsilon nu, which makes the yeah, <laughs> which makes the final um, final conditions even even uh, I would not say worse, but less uh, appealing to look at. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, they might not be too appealing, but they exist. And um, with that, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Wonderful, thanks so much. So before we get to questions, let's briefly unmute ourselves and applaud for the speaker. Okay, questions for Hanka? All right, let me start with one. So, um, I was curious if you could make any comments on the case of zero curvature. So first of all, am I correct to say that you sort of avoid this because your formulas for the ellipses and the hyperbolas um, don't hold there? And do you think some of the statements are still true if you have local regions with constant curvature or do you, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, well, the, should I? How should I put it? I mean, the reason why we didn't consider this case um, sort of at, at all from the start is because this has already been solved. Um, so actually the original question was posed, um, you, you have these three parameters, right? And the original question was, can you express these parameters or can you bound these parameters in terms of the absolute curvature? Yeah. So if the absolute curvature is small, meaning if the, you know, if the manifold is almost flat, then you've got the same results. I see. So it's sort of handled when your curvature is close to zero and exactly. you're handling when your curvature is fixed, you know, but in some positive neighborhood or fixed, but in some neg negative negative. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, so like my idea is, um, or at least my, my, my vision, let's say, is that if you take your manifold, you want to kind of split it first into three regions. Uh, there is a region where the curvature is sort of close to zero. Um, then there are regions where the curvature is um, positive and where the curvature is negative. But of course, this is a bit this is a bit tricky because you can have um, you can have a region where the where the I mean th there is no one sectional curvature, right? There are lots of sectional curvatures at the point. So you can have that one sectional curvature is extremely large and the other one is extremely negatively large. And this case is not handled basically by, by any of any of those cases. Or I mean it, it will be handled by the Euclidean case, but it will be handled very badly. With yeah. Um, so it, yeah. But in particular, if all your sectional curvatures are say between 10 and 11, right? You could use the prior case, you know, bounded around curvature zero, but it'd just be, you know, so many points and such strong yes. guarantees. And so you get much better guarantees by 
by exactly. sort of more wisely comparing to you know a sphere with that, with that exactly yeah. that's really that nice. was actually the original idea that um I mean, you can always you can always use this this Euclidean case say, uh, for basically any kind of manifold. But if the manifold is, let's say, a sphere of of, of radius, you know, all point nothing, um, yeah. So it has a very high curvature. Um, you can still triangulate it like that. You don't need any specific, you know, except for general con general position. You don't need anything. But this theory this theory uh, would give you extremely bad bonds. Um, yeah. But if the if the like if the curvature varies a lot, like at one point, then you cannot use basically any of these three theories. Unfortunately, <laughs> yet. <laughs> Further questions? So I have another question if you'll humor me. Of course. <laughs> so, uh, okay, <laughs> I'll try to make this a question, but it's a little bit of a comment question. So I'm curious if you've thought of relationships to Lachev's result. So Lachev's result is um, result about um, butor strips complexes, say of point samples from a Riemannian manifold. And um, I, th I think his proof, he's always sort of comparing to um, Euclidean space, right? So he's pretending the curvature is near zero. Mm -hmm. um, uh, experts on this stuff don't necessarily understand all of, his, all of his steps. So I think there's a need for much nicer proofs. He's, he's not trying to get homeomorphic equivalents, right? He's trying to get homotopy equivalents. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the... Um, the Cartier mean map that you describe is something that's sort of been been started to be used for rips complexes, but but wasn't wasn't really um, I think in the forefront of people's mind when when Lachef was doing his work. Um, I had some other comment. Oh, and and I mean I'm not sure if I totally understand it, but somehow um, when he's trying to get things only up to homotopy equivalence, he maybe doesn't need assumptions on mu. Um, you know, he doesn't need to control the spread so much on the density. So I'm curious, have you thought about this at all? Or, or do you think some of the techniques could work? Um, um, so I don't, uh, I, I unfortunately don't know about the work. So I, I cannot uh, sort of uh, relate directly. But um, I, I think that, um, that, that this project contains many kind of sub or, or, or false problems, say. That can be applied in in so many different different parts. Like for example, this this knowledge about the dilated bisectors is sort of interested by by itself, interesting by itself. Like you have this explicit formula, and I'm sure that you can use it at different occasions, not only to to do this higher dimension remaining stuff. I mean, the formulas also work in two dimensions. So, so in, in that case, I'm I'm sure there are like lots of applications of different parts of the project by themselves. Um, of course, it would be it would be super interesting to have a look at um, generalizing, say, or, or considering the same questions um, that you were just talking about, not comparing spaces to Euclidean spaces, but to spaces of um, constant curve, so to, to spheres or to, to hyperbolic spaces. And like my experience is that, um, that the techniques that you want to use for the Euclidean space and the techniques that you want to use for the other two cases are completely or very different very often. But the techniques that you use for the you know uh, spheres and for the uh, hyper uh, hyperbolic space are usually very similar. Um, so somehow you 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 have a hard time solving the first one. Usually you start with the spherical case because you can draw it a bit easier, say, uh, and it takes you forever to solve. And then, and then the hyperbolic case, you just get like this. It's it's quite fascinating. So, yeah, it's definitely something one could look into. Very nice. Any last questions for our speaker? Well, if not, thanks so much, everybody, and let me stop the recording here.